I do want to introduce our first speaker. His name is Dr. John Holden. Dr. Holden is a highly qualified liver fellow here with us at IU School of Medicine. He actually has a specialized interest in uh, chronic liver disease and management thereof. He's just an amazing clinician. I've had the pleasure of working with him commonly. And uh, I, I know he's a true patient advocate, so that's one reason I invited him here to speak. He'll be presenting a very important foundation topic for us, Liver 101. Thanks, Dr. Holden. Thank you, Dr. Lambert. I appreciate the introduction, and it's a true pleasure to be here talking to you all today. Um, Dr. Lambert gave me a topic to talk about, Liver 101, and I think that we could talk about any number of things, uh, certainly. But we'll try and uh, highlight a few areas that I think can um, just provide a basic overview of what the liver is, what it does, and hopefully uh, give you some information that provides a little bit of structure and uh, for some of the other things that we'll talk about uh, today and tomorrow. Uh, start off by saying that I have no disclosures and then go over the aims of our talk today and that's basically just to talk a little bit about the structure of the liver, uh, talk a little bit about what the liver is and what it actually does and uh, go over a little bit about some of the tests that we look at when we're monitoring the liver in a, in a clinician's office. So, uh, where is the liver? The liver is in the right upper quadrant of our abdomen. Uh, it sits below the lung, just below the diaphragm. It sits to the right of your stomach and just above your pancreas, um, as well as some of your intestines. Uh, generally, in the normal person, weighs about three to three and a half pounds. And from top to bottom is about 15 centimeters or so. Traditionally, uh, the liver has been divided into two compartments, a uh, left lobe and a right lobe. Um, and classically, the left lobe is a fair bit smaller than the right. You'll see some of these other structures here on this slide, and I'll go over those in a little more detail. From a functional standpoint, uh, we really can think about the liver to a fair degree in terms of its blood supply. You'll see at the bottom something here called the portal vein uh, coming up to the liver. In addition, you'll see some red arteries coming in. And the liver is somewhat unique as opposed to other organs in the body. It has two blood flow sources, uh, both a venous source, the portal vein, which takes blood from not only the spleen but the intestines, but also the hepatic artery, which is receiving its blood flow off of the aorta, which is the major blood vessel that comes from the heart. These two sources of blood come together in the liver, reach the liver cells or hepatocytes, then ultimately the blood supply from the liver drains to at the top here, the hepatic vein. Uh, and the hepatic vein ultimately goes back to the heart and takes the blood flow from the liver back to the heart. Ultimately, the liver receives about 70% of its blood flow through the portal vein and about 30% through the hepatic arteries. Uh, but because the portal vein is a vein, the actual oxygen content of the blood is, is somewhat imbalanced in that about 60% of the oxygen that the liver sees comes from the hepatic artery and about 40% from the portal vein. Talk a little bit about why this is important. Um, as we think about the actual structure of the liver, the liver is actually thought about in segments. And there are actually about eight segments to the liver. And they're really dictated by the blood flow, not only that that comes from the portal vein, but also that that's coming from the hepatic artery. Um, this first segment that we see up here is actually called the caudate lobe. And that left lobe that I showed you earlier is comprised of the second and third segments. The right lobe comprised of the additional segments. And I bring these up uh, just to kind of show you that uh, the liver is fairly complicated. There's a lot going on. There's a lot of blood supply that's fairly complex. And there's lots of segments that are important. These segments from a day to day are not so important, but actually somewhat relevant when we think about surgical interventions to the liver. It's a little bit of the view of the kind of big liver or macroscopic liver. I'll show you a little bit of a view of how we think of the liver at a microscopic level or cellular level. This slide here at this picture, what you'll see here in these little gray rectangles are hepatocytes or liver cells. And the liver is comprised of rows and rows of these hepatocytes or liver cells. And the basic structure of these rows of uh, hepatocytes is called a sinusoid. The sinusoid basically is comprised of a uh, hepatic, very small hepatic artery, as well as a very small portal vein. And the blood flow from these two comes together, 
runs along the liver cells or hepatocytes. Liver cells do their thing, and we'll talk a little bit about what that thing is. And then ultimately, uh, the blood flow leaves the liver through a central vein and flows back to the heart. You'll see a green structure kind of running in the opposite direction, and I think it's important to know that one of the other important components of the liver is uh, bile structures. Uh, here, what you can see is what's called a bile canaliculus. And bile is important because it's synthesized by the liver cells and plays an important role in our digestion. And I'll cover that a little more here in a moment. I'll just give you a, a quick picture here of kind of what these actually look like if you look at them under a microscope. On the left here, you can see uh, what actually is the portal vein and hepatic artery. On the right here, the big hollow structure in the middle is the central vein. And you'll see a couple of white structures leading up to those. And that's what the actual sinusoids look like if you look under a microscope. So I mentioned on the previous slide a little bit about bile ductules. And just to give you a little bit of a sense of what the bile ducts look like in the body as they get bigger, all those tiny little bile ductules join together to find, form larger bile ducts. Ultimately, they flow together to form a common hepatic duct and flow down from the liver, down towards the pancreas, and to the small intestine. You'll also see the gallbladder on this picture. And the gallbladder forms, uh, plays an important role in storing bile. And ultimately, when we eat, the gallbladder, as well as all these bile ducts, release bile into the small intestine. And bile plays an important role in our digestion. In particular, it plays a very important role in digesting fats, which we need for our day-to-day -day functions. All right. So that's a little bit of the structure of the liver. You've got your liver here and your abdomen. You've got a fairly unique blood supply to it. You've got the both kind of big picture as well as little picture. You get a little bit of sense of what some of the bile ducts look like in the liver. So what does the liver actually do? You'll see here a picture of a gentleman. Um, does anyone recognize this picture or know who this is? All right, don't expect you to. But this is uh, Prometheus. And uh, in Greek mythology, Prometheus was notable for having given fires to humans. And he was punished by the Greek gods uh, to be chained to a rock. And there on the rock every day, a vulture would come, and it would peck at Prometheus's liver and eat his liver every day, only for Prometheus to be left at night where his liver would regenerate, only to be subjected to the same punishment every day. I put this here just to kind of emphasize the idea that we've had some basic knowledge of the liver for a long time. Um, going back to the days of the Greeks, there was a famous surgeon by the name of Galen. And his uh, theories regarding the liver actually were prominent for hundreds of years, perhaps actually over a thousand or so. And he created a theory of the four humors of the body, which comprised of blood, phlegm, yellow bile, and black bile. And under Galen's system, there were three prominent organs in uh, basically human function, the liver, the brain, and the blood. And together, these helped regulate the four humors of the body. And under Galen's system, the liver was important in that it was responsible for synthesizing the blood in the body and was the source of all the veins in the body. We now know that's not exactly the case, but I bring it up to say that we've known something about the liver for a long time. And uh, since the time of Galen, we've actually learned quite a few new things about it. And I'll try and spend a little time going over some of what we know these days. This is an incredibly complicated picture. I don't want anyone to uh, take anything away from this picture other than one thing. This is a map of human metabolism and was created probably about a decade or so ago by a number of biochemists and uh, specialists in the functions of the human body and was designed to map every chemical reaction in the human body. Uh, on a practical day-to-day -day basis, this isn't very useful, but I think it's somewhat useful in the context of today's talk because the liver plays an important role in a lot of these reactions. And that's the one thing I want you to take away from this slide, which is to say that the liver is really important for a lot of things that go on in the human body. This is a, a subway map version of this same slide, and, and I don't know about you guys, but I still find this kind of incredibly complex. I just put this up there to say that the human body is incredibly complex, and the liver plays a really important role in all of it. So we'll talk about. Um, 
kind of try and break it down as best we can to talk about some of the things the liver does. And the first thing I'll talk about is the important role that the liver plays in human metabolism. And in particular, uh, the way that we manage carbohydrates, particularly glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids, which are the building blocks of proteins. So to touch a little bit, liver plays a really important role in our management of glucose. So glucose is the main sugar one of the most important fuels in the human body that maintains our activity from moment to moment. The liver plays a role in maintaining that glucose level from second to second. Not only does it play a role when uh, we take in fuel from our intestines and in processing that fuel, but it actually stores excess glucose as a compound called glycogen. And when we get, uh, when we're not eating, when we're fasting, the liver releases glucose molecules from these larger glycogen molecules into the human body so that we can maintain enough glucose to do the activities that we need to do on a moment-to-moment -moment basis. In addition, in times of starvation, the liver is able to take other molecules such as fatty acids as well as proteins and break those down into glucose molecules so we can do what we need to do. Liver also plays a really important role in uh, processing fats, uh, and in particular fatty acids in our body. Um, so when we take in fats, the fats that we take in through our body are basically packaged in combination with proteins. And the liver plays an important role in this packaging of fatty acids in our body. Uh, it synthesizes molecules called VLDLs. And these are ultimately the precursors to molecules called HDL or LDL. And you may have heard of these molecules before is, um, if you've ever had your cholesterol checked, these are major components of uh, the fats that we see in our body. In addition to that, the liver plays a really important role in the synthesis of amino acids in our body. Um, it takes some of the non-essential amino acids, uh, or I'm sorry, the essential amino acids that we get from our diet and synthesizes additional amino acids that we need for regular protein function. In addition to synthesizing amino acids, uh, it plays an important role in breaking down those amino acids. So the body takes the nitrogen compounds generated from our amino acids and gets rid of them, both through the livers as well as the kidneys through a process called the urea cycle. All right, that's just touching a little bit on some of the metabolic function of the liver. In addition to that, the liver serves a warehouse function. So it basically serves as a store for a number of important molecules. In addition to the glycogen that I mentioned, which is basically a storage form of glucose, it stores about a two year supply of vitamin A three months supply of vitamin D, two years supply of vitamin B12, and is a really important store of iron and copper for the body. In addition to serving as a storage place, it serves really important synthesis functions. We talked about a few of those just a moment ago, but it also synthesizes some really important large molecules for the body. This is a picture of a protein called albumin. And albumin is the major protein component of the blood. Without albumin, we wouldn't actually be able to hold blood within our blood vessels. And so it's really important for that purpose. In addition to albumin, it synthesizes clotting factors. So every time that you get a cut, and when you start bleeding from that cut, that bleeding stops, you can thank your liver for synthesizing the clotting factors that help stop that bleeding. And in addition to that, the liver is really important for synthesizing molecules like cholesterol. We tend to think of cholesterol as being a bad thing uh, in the way that we hear about it in the news, but cholesterol is actually a really important molecule that helps form the basis of cell membranes and keeps our cells healthy in our body. And so the liver plays a very important role in that. In addition to all those things, the liver plays a really important role in detoxification in the body. Um, we see toxins in our body every day just through what we eat in addition to the things that we put into our body, whether it be alcohol um, and drugs as well, even drugs that we want to take, the liver plays a very important role in their metabolism. We take in these toxins of one sort or another, and the liver plays an important role of basically doing chemical reactions to these toxins in a way that allows us to get rid of them from our body. So it converts them through a variety of types of reactions, oxidation, reduction, and subsequently adds on molecules uh, to these toxins so that we can get rid of them as some form of waste, whether that's in, through our bile, 
which is ultimately gotten rid of through our gallbladder and into our intestines, or whether it's released into our bloodstream and ultimately gotten rid of through our body via our kidneys. In addition to that, we talked a little bit before about the important role the liver plays in digestion. And just to touch on that for a second. So the liver synthesizes bile. Every cell in the liver, uh, or at least all of the hepatocytes, which are the prominent cell in the liver, synthesize a compound called bile. What is bile? So bile uh, is composed of bile salts, which are basically fancy forms of cholesterol. And those bile salts, in combination with a couple other substances, some different fats, some of the breakdown products of some of those toxins that we mentioned earlier, as well as um, bilirubin, which is a breakdown product of our red blood cells, come together to form the actual substance of bile. Um, what does bile do? Bile serves a couple of important functions, the most important of which we talked a little bit about before, but it aids in digestion. And what it actually does is when it's released into the small intestine, it mixes with your foods, mixes in particular with the fats that we eat in our diet, and allows the fats after mixing with bile to be absorbed by our intestines. When without that bile, we wouldn't be able to absorb fats. Uh, it serves some other functions as well as in terms of cholesterol metabolism and providing a way for us to get rid of some of the toxic substances that we mentioned earlier. Ultimately, once the bile is synthesized, we store it in the bile ducts as well as the gallbladder. And when we eat, our body sends signals to release the bile. It's then released into our intestine and mixes with our food and is subsequently reabsorbed to a large extent, not only in the small bowel, but the large bowel as well. In addition, and we keep saying all the things that the liver does, but this kind of just emphasizes how many different things it does. It plays an important role in uh, modifying and synthesizing certain hormones as well as the playing a role in the immune system. Just show up here a, a pathway and don't want anyone to try and memorize it other than to note that this is the pathway for human growth hormone. And the liver plays a really important uh, role in synthesizing one of the downstream mediators of the human growth hormone, a factor called IGF-1. In addition to that, the liver plays an important role in um, uh, thyroid hormone metabolism and also activates vitamin D. And the liver plays a really critical role in the immune system as well. Not only does the liver have important immune cells, cells within the liver itself uh, that help play an important role in our immunity from the food that we see from our intestines, but it synthesizes a lot of really important proteins. And the proteins that you see up here are something called complements. And the complements are a critical part of our innate immune system. I show you that just to say that without our liver functioning well, it can have effects on our immune system. So that's it. Uh, not really it, but touches on some of the things that our liver does. I just wanted to give you a little bit of a flavor for all the important things that the liver, liver does for us on a daily basis. Touch briefly now on liver function tests, and you'll see that I have function in quotes here. Uh, and I think it's important to, to keep that in mind. When we're following patients in the clinic, we will often send off a panel of tests, which are commonly referred to as liver function tests, but might be better called liver enzyme tests or liver biochemical tests. Uh, the reason that I bring that up is that some of the tests that we follow aren't necessarily direct measures of the liver's actual function, and I'll talk about that in a little detail. So I'll mention a couple of tests that we commonly send off and, and measure in clinic, and I think many of you will be familiar with some of these things. Uh, I'll mention three here, ALT, AST, and uh, ALK-FOS. So ALT is an abbreviation for an enzyme called alanine aminotransferase, AST for an enzyme called aspartate aminotransferase, and these are some of the core liver enzymes that we follow in people with autoimmune hepatitis. Uh, what are these enzymes? These are basically enzymes that transfer amino or nitrogen complexes from one molecule to another in the human body. Uh, alanine aminotransferase is actually fairly specific to hepatocytes, which we've got a diagram of up here, and it's actually found kind of out and around the outside of the nucleus in the hepatocyte. Uh, AST is actually found in hepatocytes as well and is actually found in some of these structures called mitochondria. You can see an example of kind of what that looks like down in the right lower quadrant of the diagram there. Um, 
Of note, ALT is fairly specific to liver enzyme cells. AST is actually found in a number of other cells throughout the body and can be found in muscle as well as the kidney, the brain. Um, these are important because uh, they're good markers of inflammation for the liver. Uh, not necessarily function tests, but when we see that these levels are elevated, it makes us concerned that there's some kind of inflammatory process in the liver. And that's one of the reasons that we follow them in autoimmune hepatitis, is looking for signs of inflammation in the liver. Alkaline phosphatase is another molecule that we follow as well. It plays a role in removing phosphates uh, from molecules within the body. It's found not only on liver cells, but also within uh, the cells of the bile duct as well, and so is a good marker for injury not only to liver cells, but bile duct cells as well. Alkaline phosphatase is not specific to the liver, and we actually see that alkaline phosphatase can be elevated in the body under other circumstances as well, because it can be found in the small intestine, the bone, and actually we can see that it uh, arises from the placenta as well. So we can see alkaline phosphatase uh, elevated in a couple circumstances other than just damage to the liver. So you break your bone, your alkaline phosphatase may go up. If you're pregnant, you may see that your alkaline phosphatase goes up. Overall, though, I want to just emphasize that these are things that we follow and are good signs and markers of inflammation in the liver. So if those are signs of inflammation, what are actual liver function tests? Well, we can follow a couple of things uh, for markers of uh, liver function, and I'll give you a couple examples of those up here, bilirubin, albumin, and INR. Uh, the important caveat, I think, to this is that they're a little less sensitive, and in general, uh, we can't follow them quite as well until the liver is more severely damaged. And so, for the most part, in people who have a, a good functioning liver, they're not very sensitive. So what is bilirubin? Bilirubin, as I talked a little bit about earlier, is a breakdown product of red blood cells. The bilirubin molecule in red blood cells is actually what's important for holding on to oxygen that the red blood cells are carrying to the rest of our body. And as red blood cells are broken down or turned over in our body, they release this compound bilirubin into the bloodstream. The liver plays an important role in the bilirubin uh, metabolism because it takes the bilirubin it conjugates it, it adds a molecule onto it so that the bilirubin can ultimately be um, gotten rid of by the human body. And so you'll see that there are different forms of bilirubin sometimes on your panels of liver functions, both conjugated and unconjugated. The liver plays the important role in conjugating bilirubin. Ultimately, if the liver is impaired then, Bilirubin levels can be seen to rise, but it's important to note that bilirubin increases are not necessarily specific to liver function. We can also see these levels go up if, for instance, you have a high turnover of red blood cells. Uh, bilirubin is also important because many of you may be uh, familiar with the concept of jaundice. Uh, jaundice is something that is basically a yellowing of the skin or eyes and can be seen in some liver conditions. Um, and in particular, we see jaundice when bilirubin levels are elevated, generally with a cutoff of around 2.5 or so. Albumin is another important marker of liver function. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the important synthetic function of the liver, and one of the molecules the liver synthesizes, again, is albumin. Albumin plays an important role in kind of holding on to our blood volume and keeping it within our blood vessels. And if the liver's function is impaired, it synthesizes less albumin. And so if uh, the liver is impaired, we can sometimes see that albumin levels are low. INR, a fancy term, basically stands for international normalized ratio. Don't expect you to remember that exactly, but is relevant in that it measures indirectly the level of clotting factors in our blood. So again, if our liver isn't too healthy, if it's not synthesizing molecules well, then it doesn't synthesize clotting factors. And as a result, the time it takes our blood to clot increases, and this INR value can be found to be abnormal. All right. This is just a brief slide to give a little bit of a sense of what normal values are. Um, uh, these are normal values as defined by the IU Health Labs. I'll, I'll make some kind of caveats as I point these values out to you. See ALT from 7 to 52, AST 13 to 39, ALKFOS slightly higher than that, BILI 0 to 1, albumin 3.5 to 5. I don't want you necessarily to remember all these values, but just so that you may have seen them before. 
um, and you probably have received a printout from your doctor at one point or another. Um, I think the important thing to know about these reference ranges are that these are ranges that are devised by individual labs. They generally represent 95% of the normal population. So even uh, if we look at 100 individuals, a couple individuals may fall just outside of these normal ranges, though not too far. Uh, and it's important to know that there are some variations in these values, not only by a person's age, but also by their sex, uh, their ethnicity, as well as by their weight. So it's important to know that there can be some variations to these values. Another important caveat, uh, particularly for ALT or AST, is that there are some liver experts who would caution that maybe the higher ranges that you see here are too high to be considered normal, that maybe we should consider that those upper ranges are actually a little bit abnormal. Um, so I've mentioned just a couple of liver tests, the things that we commonly test for. I'll just briefly mention a couple of other things, uh, tests that we send sometimes in autoimmune hepatitis. You may know that in people with autoimmune hepatitis, we follow immunoglobulin levels sometimes, and that there are other autoimmune markers that are important, uh, particularly in the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis things called anti-nuclear antibodies, smooth muscle antibodies, or liver kidney microsomal antibodies. I bring these up just so you've kind of seen them. And uh, Dr. Lambert, I know in his talk, plans to talk a little bit more about the diagnosis of autoimmune hepatitis. And so you'll hear about these in a little more detail coming up. That's it. I just want to thank you for taking the time to listen to me. Hopefully learned a little bit more about the structure of the liver the kind of uh, wide variety of things the liver does to help us in our daily basis, and a little bit of an overview of some of the things that we monitor on a day-to-day -day basis or at least a regular basis for our patients with autoimmune hepatitis. Thank you very much.